Welcome to the Liberation Diner. This week, we'll be discussing organic food. Certified Organic is a government label declaring that they believe that a certain farm product meets their production standards. Unfortunately, there are many myths out there about what organic actually means. For instance, many people believe that organic means it's a better food. Currently, there is no real evidence that organic foods are healthier, more nutritious, or tastier. Now say you've had organic food from your garden or a roadside stand, you might be like, oh, that food is so much better. And I bet it did taste better than the food from the supermarket. That is probably true. The reason why though, is because that food was more fresh. When you're getting your food from a food stand or a garden, you're picking it at the peak ripeness. When you buy it from a store, they have to have a way to ship food across hundreds of miles and then it has to sit on the display case for several days until somebody buys it and then brings it home and finally eats it. At the end of that, it has to still be edible. The way they do this is they pick the fruit or the vegetable extremely underripe. Then they ship it and when it gets into the store, it'll either begin ripening or they will force it to ripen in the store. Another myth is that chemicals are not used on organic foods. In fact, a variety of chemicals may be used safely. Remember when I said that food is ripened in stores? There's a chemical called ethylene, E-T-H-Y-L-E-N-E, -E, which they use to ripen unripe bananas. Additionally, some organic foods are still allowed to contain pesticides. A third myth is that farmers are welcoming the certified organic label. In reality, this is another regulation that hurts small business. Many small farmers find that customers are feeling like they're paying more for the same product. These farmers are also paying high auditing fees, they have high record keeping costs, and for a, a lot of farmers and a lot of small businesses, they would rather have a sellable product than have one destroyed by pests and disease. It doesn't matter if it's organic or not, if bugs came and ate all the plants. So what are some alternatives to these government organic labels? Well, one popular one is called Certified Naturally Grown. It's also known as CNG. This is very similar to organic, certified government organic, that is, except the fees are all voluntary, there is very minimal paperwork, and there's a unique way that inspections are performed. Instead of having government agents perform the inspections on these farms, they're performed by volunteer local farmers. Now, these farmers have stricter standards than the government provides, but how they reinforce them is, let's say farmer A, farmer B, farmer C all sign up for this certified naturally grown. What will happen is farmer A will go over to farmer B's farm and make sure that they are up to the standard. Then farmer B will go to farmer C and farmer C will go to farmer A. That way you have a network of farmers all looking out at each other, all watching each other's backs and making sure everything is following these guidelines. But at the same time, you don't have two farmers watching each other's farms so there's a little bit more responsibility there. Additionally, now the government doesn't really like this for their own standards, do they? Uh, additionally, Certified Naturally Grown is pretty big on transparency, so the, the profiles and documentation of these farms are transparent. If you want to know more about that, check out naturallygrown.org. I will provide this link and other links you can hear in the show, uh, in the show notes. 
another label that is somewhat smaller and very localized uh, is the Homegrown label. This label is provided by the Montana Sustainable Growers Union, which is a group of Montana farmers and just smaller farms that got annoyed, got together together, they, they got annoyed with the um, overbearing certified organic label and decided that uh, not only was it not being run correctly, but it didn't cover the items that they thought would make for a good small farm or a good organic-like farm. Uh, so they came up with a 10-point pledge of the items that they believe a farm should be following. Uh, unique to their label, uh, they include a lot of discussion or a lot of rules on selling practices, um, specifically selling locally and not shipping food too far away. But uh, another financial aspect of this uh, certification is the idea of workers' rights, as in how much the workers are getting paid, how much work they have to do, like. How, how many hours a week they have to work, that sort of thing. Uh, just a focus on making sure that it's fair wage and meeting minimum wage standards. So that's a pretty unique twist. That's definitely significantly different than certified naturally grown. Finally, another one that hasn't really taken off yet, but has some potential and I think has a big base of potential followers just based on its audience. Uh, that, that would be Agritrue, A-G-R-I-T-R-U-E. You can find out more about this one at agritrue.com. Uh, what Agritrue is is pretty similar to Certified Naturally Grown. Uh, it's got a lot of focus on transparency. But additionally, um, its unique factor is its focus on the ability to develop a consumer-to-farmer relationship. So not only does it provide profiles that each farm or farmer would have about what products they provide and how they grow them and where they're located, but they also are trying to promote um, having the consumer, having the end purchaser who wants to buy this produce actually contacting the farm and arranging perhaps um, a meeting or a tour of the farm but also uh, I would just I would think that they are really for having you start a supply chain where you're buying your food regularly from them you know maybe you get whatever, a, a case or something of local produce or whatever every week. That sort of relationship seems to be their focus. Uh, I say, I said, or I said before that they seem like they have a big audience out there. Um, that's because the creator of AgriTrue is Jack Spearco of the Survival Podcast, which is a pretty popular podcast that discusses modern survivalism, so a focus on growing our own food and getting ready for just the world around you. And I think his fr his catchphrase is um, something for being being ready to survive or something if the world goes bad or even if it doesn't or something like that. Um, so. A lot of good, strong audience there, and if you're going to go with uh, starting up an alternative label like this, you're going to need a big customer base because it's not really going to work if you have this label on your food or on your farm or on your website and nobody knows what that means and nobody trusts it, but if you start seeing certified naturally grown everywhere or you start seeing ag or true recommended or something like that it's gonna give you that ease of mind and 
it's good, it's going to resonate well with the consumers. Before moving on to the second part of our talk, I'd like to read a little motivational quote from John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. There is always need of persons not only to discover new truths and point out when what were once truths are true no longer, but also to commence new practices and set the example of more enlightened conduct and better taste and sense in human life. I feel like that's pretty relevant to our tasks of starting alternatives to government services. Why don't we take a nice look at the headlines in the news lately and see what's going on. Here's an article from bizjournals.com. Fairfax jumps into food truck regulation game. Where food truck operators had to fight for parking spots and time limits in the district. It's a whole different ballgame in Fairfax County. The Fairfax County Board is preparing to review proposed food truck regulations, but that county's regulations will deal mainly with food trucks parked on private property rather than public roadways. So what this article is about, and I will be posting the link to it so you can read it yourself, but it's basically, it was a free-for-all uh, as far as local rules were concerning in this town and they were seeing that other cities and other towns had time limits and specific parking spots for these food trucks and of course the government bureaucrats can't let that stand you can't have uh, free trade going on here you have to you have to impose limits I mean what are you gonna do let them park wherever they want well, if you read this article here, they explain there's already rules for them parking on the public streets. Uh, those, those regulations already existed. Um, what these people want to do is they want to regulate whether you're parking on private property. So what they're saying is you have to have at least 30,000 square feet of property you have to pay an application fee to get a permit um, you're gonna have to pay that every year and of course you know that once that they, they push this through with like a small dollar amount so they'll say oh a hundred dollars just a hundred dollars a year and you can be a food truck in our city no problem right but you know eventually they're gonna have a budget problem and they're just gonna increase it that's the way it goes next thing you know you're gonna need to pay a thousand dollars just to park here and of course this isn't even parking on streets this is parking on private property so to have a truck on your own property you have to ask permission so let's see uh, what's what's another article okay here's another one food navigator hyphen usa.com kind of a silly website name but They've got an interesting article. Uh, the title is, Non-GMO, Not Necessarily Organic, and Other GMO Myths Busted. With all the attention GMOs have received in recent months, good and bad, confusion in the marketplace is inevitably followed, as consumers scramble to make sense of the pro and anti-camps arguments, and product manufacturers scramble to keep track of what consumers want. So they're saying, uh, we have certified organic label, and then we have uh, a thing called GMO. Uh, we'll have a show about this in the future, but GMO means genetically modified organism. And a lot of people out there are getting confused because they're thinking, oh, organic, that means good, right? Oh, GMOs, that means bad. So they're, And then they get confused again, they say, Oh, non-GMOs must be good, non-organic must be bad. And then they, they go so far as to equating them to the same thing. 
non-GMO does not mean organic, and organic does not mean non-GMO. I've, I've heard people tell me this before, like, oh, I'd be so glad to grow my own food because I could have it non-GMO because it's organic. It's like, no, they don't necessarily have to equal each other. So what the confusion is, is here is you have the phrase, of course, like, you know, government, they have to have this legalese, so they have to define everything. So there's they're getting all up in a, like a huffy or whatever, you know, getting all pissed off because there's non-GMO as a phrase, as a term, you know, but then there's also GMO free. And they're saying, oh, GMO free means it's 100% free of GMOs. You can't call it GMO free because we can't guarantee it. Even if we do testing on it, there's still the potential that our testing is inaccurate. But they're saying so they're saying GMO free not allowed because we can't we can't do that but saying non GMO which in my mind means the exact same thing it's either GMO or it isn't but they're saying non GMO doesn't necessarily mean that it's hundred percent non GMO so it's just stupid legalese so now it's gonna be something like we're not gonna, the government's not gonna allow the label GMO free. But you can call your food non GMO if you want to. So, no GMO free, yes to non GMO. As though, in a consumer's mind, there's any difference in any way. Just another silly government decision. Just, they're just wasting time. You know, they're just having board meetings over this. Just having a blast. What's our next article here? From stowtoday.com, uh, FDA backs down on cheese regulation. So, for those of you who weren't following the story over the past few weeks, uh, what happened is uh, Obama, during his term here, has passed some legislation basically that. Um, tells the Food and Drug Administration that they need to crack down a lot more on regulating and controlling how restaurants and food producers do their practices, but specifically for safety concerns. Um, so one of the items that was in this, in this legislation was that they, well, it's kind of complicated because, uh, so what happened is they're only, the businesses are only allowed to use cutting boards and cutting surfaces and that sort of thing that can be safely and properly cleaned to whatever level that the FDA says. And now, sometime later, the FDA has decided that only cutting boards like plastic cutting boards are going to be okay and wooden cutting boards because you can't it's very difficult to get all the bacteria out of a wooden cutting board because they're so porous they're saying you can't use wooden cutting boards at all or wooden shelves that food sits directly on in the production of food now the issue here is cheese makers um, so cheese making is a very very old process like it hasn't really changed that much in a long time but cheese makers especially the small time ones have historic recipes that, the, that have been passed down where they're making these fancy fancy cheeses on wooden boards because when you make cheese you press it together and then you basically put it in the equivalent of a large cellar and just let it sit there and age for a long time uh, years multiple years you know you could have 20 year cheddar and th that 20 year cheddar could be sitting on this board now these recipes that have gone on for 
hundreds of years, you know, uh, require those wooden boards. And the FDA was flexing its muscles, and they didn't actually crack down on anyone, but they were saying, we're not going to allow this anymore, and in the future, we're going to make sure that you have plastic boards for your cheese to be sitting on and not wooden ones. Now, the, so the issue, the issue with this is, first off, these small cheese producers, as usual, the small business versions are going to be screwed over the most. They're not going to be able to pay for all the shelves to be switched out for unnecessary reasons because obviously nobody's dying from eating all this cheese. It's just, you don't hear of cheese, contaminated cheese poisoning on a mass scale, you know, because they used wooden cutting boards. It just doesn't happen. But the small producers are not going to be able to afford to switch out all their shelving. It's just a huge expense. So they're going to have to find some way of absorbing that cost or just not be in business anymore. The, F the FDA will just shut them down. But of course, the people who lobby for regulation, the large corporations, they'll be fine. They probably already are using plastic uh, or they could easily make the switch because they've got huge budgets. They'll, they would rather pay the many thousands of dollars to switch over to plastic shelving just so that their competitors, the small time producers of cheese, would go out of business. They would rather do that than to have their own freedom of choice, of course. And so that's that's the first problem, is these small time producers can't afford to do this. The second problem is their product that they are producing it's specifically like this the way they make the cheese that is the recipe the way they the ingredients they put in the cheese but also what they put on the outside of the cheese to seal it all together and then the the temperature of the room the humidity the wood underneath the cheese all that that is all part of the recipe you're not going to get this award-winning cheese like you might see that comes out of these small producers if you start messing with the recipe with these stupid government regulations. So anyway, that's what's been going on the past few weeks is a lot of protest over it from these um, small creameries and that sort of business. So now the FDA, they, they're actually responding to the protests and saying, oh no, we're sorry. Um, fine, That's we're, we're not going to interpret it that way, at least not right now. And they're actually, for once, they're actually, you know, going to back down on this. Um, they decided they're not, they're not going to do anything about this part of the regulation, because obviously they're going to get way too much crap about it. Uh, so I guess it'll have to be something to watch out for in the future uh, because technically the laws are still there and the rules are still there so we'll just have to see what they do. Uh, the next article here from Forbes.com this one is not hugely food related but it's a really good article uh, it's got some very good points in it. It's called The Cure for Regulation Destabilization. Uh, it's from the June 30th, 2014 issue of Forbes. Uh, the article, I guess I'm just going to read some quotes from the article because uh, it's such a great article. All right. As promised, this is quoting, as promised, President Obama is ensuring that everyone's electricity rates will necessarily skyrocket via new Environmental Protection Agency carbon dioxide emission rules that effectively wipe out new coal power and replace it with less efficient renewables. Meanwhile, over at the Food and Drug Administration, a new rule would regulate the serving size of breath mints. No more tyranny by Tic Tacs. For, from regulating mints and food labeling, to systematic risk in banking and finance, 
and, probably soon, insurance and cyber security, no aspect of American life remains untouched by bureaucrats and presidential decree. That's why wrestling down federal spending and taxation won't suffice anymore. Regulations are equally as punitive. So, after this, the article goes on to throw a lot of numbers at you about exactly how much regulation we have in the U.S., what it's costing us, how that compares to the federal budget, and it's really shocking. It's really shocking. They are comparing these numbers to how much the average household is spending on health and food and that sort of thing, and just showing you just this massive, massive bureaucracy we have right now in the U.S., and how it's really bogging down our economy. Because I really, I really feel that they're hitting the nail on the head here, where if you want to create more jobs, if you want to help out the economy, if you want to make everyone wealthier, just stop this regulation. Just stop. Just start stripping it away. It's just going to put money right back into everybody's pockets. People are going to be able to go out. They're going to start their businesses. They're going to be able to take the risks that need to be taken or need to be took by entrepreneurs. It's going to be better for everyone. So that's from Forbes. So of course it's going to be a pretty quality article. Um, again, there will be a link to it. Uh, I really suggest if you're going to check out any of the articles or links that I've spoken about here, uh, I suggest this one. Uh, it's not specifically food related, but it, hit, it really hits the nail on the head. Pretty soon, I will be having a website popping up where, if you'd like to, you may listen to past episodes of this show or check out the links that are discussed on the show. Additionally, there's going to be a speak pipe option on the website where you, yes you, can click and record your own voice and I, if I like it, I'll play it on the show. If I don't like your voice, I will maybe discuss it on the show. But if you have your opinion and you'd like to get it out there uh, relating to food, food regulation, and the restaurant industry, that's going to be a great option for you. I definitely recommend you take advantage of that speak pipe. Uh, tune in next time. Perhaps we'll be talking about lime prices and how they are affected by the war on drugs. Uh, I think we'll also talk about insects and how they're the anti-global warming food.